welcome to the fourth annual Guild of Music Supervisors Conference. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Leon Vitali. I'm curious, when you were an actor and you were in Barry Lyndon and you were doing your performance and you were recognizing that this was something um, very unique, do you remember the choice of how to approach Stanley and say, I want to be more than just, you know, Lord Bullworth? Yes, I do, because what he used to do, he used to have me in costume and made up and sitting outside whatever set he was filming on and uh, until they rapped. So I was just there every day. And it was while I was sitting there and I just suddenly realized that there are all these people all engaged. I mean, it was the biggest crew I'd ever seen in my life. And they were all engaged in the same objective. You know, there's, there's, everyone's working because this picture has to work here or the next stage of the storytelling wouldn't work. And so I started talking to him about that when he was a film freak, and, and so am I to a, to a point. And we started talking about you know, films, and he said I could be on set whenever I wanted to be, uh, which was very rare. If he didn't have anything to do, usually he just kept off, you know? And, um, and it was then I just said to him, you know, I'm really thinking of of getting involved in, in the, that side of it. And he just said to me, well, if you do something about it, let me know. And so <laughs> the next film I did, I parted my way into working in the editing room. And, um, and then I let him know. And it went from there. Do you feel like, I mean, what is interesting, and again, this is partly of this issue of service and choosing to find a way to make yourself useful. Mm. When we spoke earlier, you spoke a little bit about your childhood and about growing up with a sense of duty internally. Can you talk a little bit about maybe how some of your own childhood may have helped to put you into a position where Stanley recognized that you could be an extraordinary tool in his toolkit? Well, um, I had a kind of unusual childhood. Um, my father was a, he, he was actually a, a band leader originally, and he had his, his own band. They played kind of hot club, hot club de France, jazz like Stephen Grappelli and what have you. And he toured all over the world. But when the war came, uh, all he was a Belgian, a French Belgian. And he was uh, told he had to go muster in London. And so he did that and he was stationed uh, somewhere in the Midlands. And that's where he met my mum. And uh, after that, he became a school teacher. He was multilingual, and um, he had an all-round amazing education. But he was also extremely volatile. And I would say, you know, he uh, and, a, and a very devout Catholic. Now, I'm not going to knock Catholicism because, but I have, I, I, it's just something I, I'm not really a part of, or I don't want to be. But, you know, there is a sense of obligation that comes from somebody who is, strict anything, whether Catholic or Protestant Orthodox, or whatever it is. And, um, and so that kind of began, began to be ingrained to me. But we were also the caretakers of the school where he taught. And so when he died, uh, when I was eight years old, we all had to be sweeping out the school, the very school that I was going to. And so from when I was eight years old, there was this obligation laid on us um, that, that had to be fulfilled. And it's just something, it wasn't a burden. You never think of those things as a burden when you're in, in the situation. But it was something that stayed with me forever, I think. Well, obviously. So um, that's really the genesis of where I've come from. And film, doing film production in many ways is a perfect example of 
just take care of the problem. You know, you have an expensive undertaking, right. you have an extraordinary large group of people, right. you have to motivate everyone to get things done, right. and you have to find a way to get them done as elegantly as possible and keep your cool. Right. It truly is essentially a, a calling. It's a little bit like being a, a you know, like a, a, you know, in a monastery and having to basically take care of all the responsibilities that come with that. Right, but well, that's true. And that's true, and because Stanley worked with a very small crew, uh, when he was filming, when he wasn't actually filming, physically filming, um, it was just him and me dealing with all of that stuff. Um, you know, when we released, uh, you know, the video market opened up, then we we took it on office by office around the world, and uh, so it, it was all kept very very tight. And I think that's there's a. There's a downside to that, there's no doubt about it, but there's also a big upside to it, which is it remains basically in control, you know, uh, and, and we can move it and manipulate it and, um, and just sort of shape it any way we, we like, as long as it sort of stayed within a reasonable budget, which Warner's kind of let you know what it was, and then you he had another battle. <laughs> right, <laughs> yeah. right. Yeah, absolutely. Well, for music supervisors, you know, in many ways we are tasked with being the storytellers from the music point of view. And we're brought on board projects to essentially serve the vision of the filmmaker and find ways of both communicating with that person, getting a real sense of the story that they're telling, and even if they can't articulate with specificity what they're looking for, find a way to capture the story and present them with ideas that they connect with. Right. You had this opportunity in many ways with actors because you being an actor, getting this extraordinary opportunity to train actors through can you talk a little bit about how Stanley began to employ you as sort of a conduit of himself in the process of helping actors through their performances? Well, the first sort of significant thing, uh, job he had me do was to come to America to find the little boy for The Shining. And I saw, you know, four and a half thousand children in a period of six months. Four and a half thousand children? Four and a half thousand. Wow. Yes, <laughs> lovely little things, <laughs> and, <laughs> and, um, and the thing was, I, he used me, he wanted me to do that because I, I'm, I come from a, a background of drama school and improvisation, so what I basically used to do is, is bring them in and then I put them on yeah. video and I'd improvise little situations which kind of were connected to the story without going too, you know, deep and or scary. And um, I had boys from three and a half to nine or 10 years old, you know, coming in to see me. And this little boy named Danny Lloyd was four years old when I met him. And so Stanley left it to me to, you know, stay with him and kind of just shape him and play around with situations so that he kind of got on board without really even knowing it. And the same thing kind of happened with uh, Lee Ermey in Full Metal Jacket, because he had been, um, you know... Uh, there was an actor cast in that role originally, sorry? right? There was an actor cast in that role originally. Yeah, there were, there's, yes, two actors before him. And, um, but he, he, we were looking for extras to play the platoon, you know, the background platoon and in the barracks and what have you. And so, you know, the usual audition started out as being, you know, sitting them down. Most of them were part-time soldiers of the Territorial Army, which I think is like your National Guard here. And, uh, you know, you sit them down, you ask them their name and all those, that kind of stuff. And I kind of realized this isn't telling us very much. And so we worked it out that I'd call a whole bunch in together and line them up and then Lee Ermey could go through them one by one, just as he did when he was inducting new recruits into the Marine Corps. And I videoed it. And Stanley saw the videos. And that was it. There was nobody else who could, who could do this. But he wasn't an actor then. So what I used to do was, you know, specifically just him and myself, and we'd spend hours and hours and hours just going through the dialogue. Because they really mini monologues and some of them were almost a page long all that all that uh, talk in the barracks and and 
you know, it was quite, quite amazing the burden he had to carry. And so, you know, what we did was take all the dialogue from something like 80 hours of, you know, auditions and stuff like that. Then we boiled it down, you know, line by line. The best bits. The best bits, yeah. And so, uh, you know, he still had to learn it. And so yeah, that's, that's what we did, you know. I sort of used, you know, I threw tennis balls at him and he had to throw them back and he had to get, you know, whatever it was we were working on right three times in a row without a mistake, without a stutter, without a hesitation. And, and once no he'd done it, balls. Yeah, once he'd done that, then we knew it was locked in there. Right. And then, you know, we just went on from there. It's, it sounds like that process for actors is sort of a consistent one in a sense that learning the lines and being comfortable with the lines and then understanding the subtext of the story right. are two separate entities. And this mm. act of doing physical things, like, you know, someone has to build a puzzle while they're doing the lines, right. helps them climb out of it. And I imagine you could really calibrate when they were ready, which would allow you to, I would imagine, help Stanley in figuring out when you're ready to handle those scenes. Well, what we used to do, and what, what he did with me as an actor, um, you know, when we were going to approach a scene, he had no idea how he was going to shoot it. So he'd kick the whole crew off stage, apart from the cinematographer and the grip. And he'd say, all right, do the scene and do it the way you want to do it, the way you think you're going to do it. And, um, and don't say, I'm saving the best for the take, because I don't want to hear that, you know. So he'd go around with a little tube and be able to fix different lenses on it. He'd walk around while we were doing the scene over and over and over again for each lens change or each angle. He'd say, do it again, do it again. So by the time you came to doing the first take, you were starting up there instead of there. Mm -hmm. And the dialogue, it wasn't a question of remembering it. It was in there. It was like a muscle <laughs> movement, you know? And so, and you, could, you found out however simple, you know, the, the dialogue could be, you know, straightforward. You realize there were nuances that you could bring in that would, you know, shade the scene emotionally a little different. And once you were released to do that, then you were, you were up and running. It was great. It was the best way I ever had of working yeah. as an actor. Well, you get to discover the truth of it. I mean, this is mm. the thing which is yeah. so nice about having this long time. That's why theater can be so successful, is that right. you have so much rehearsal time. That's right. Yeah. It's very tricky in television, uh, because television has such a fast schedule yeah. that you kind of have to bring in people who can kind of climb in and discover it very quickly and efficiently and right. then move on to the next shot. And it seems right. like with what you and Stanley were able to do was to kind of let the actors discover the truth of it with you. Right. And he was creatively painting the scene in his own imagination as he's right. watching the rehearsal. From the very first angle, everything kind of exponentially came from that. That's how the scene grew cin cinematically. And, um, you know, you're absolutely right. I mean. Most of the time, I, mean, I guess when you were talking about that now, I kind of thought you had to call in your own wrecking crew, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, everyone who knows you know exactly how it's going, it should be going, right. and you know. Right. But it's a little, it's a little. Um, in television, I, I always found that a sort of a weird kind of in between uh, medium because, you know, as an actor, simply because stage work was my primary sort of start, and you have that process of six weeks, five weeks, six weeks of rehearsal, right. you know, and w with Stanley, you know, you had, and, and the film, the films that he worked on, you know, you had those periods where you could work on it, work on it, work on it creatively, but really with a, a very clear point right. going on. With television, you know, I think they, they, do, they cast more to type you know, yeah. and very often, and then it just becomes, you know, uh, uh, almost, yeah, kind of a reaction, right? You know, rather than a, a process. So it's a very different set of muscles, in a sense, yeah. and it's a different way of playing. Mm. It, I, also, for you, the, it seems like the choice to work with Stanley came at a very interesting time in your career, because you had been 
rising up as an actor. You were having more and more glamorous. I assume the parties got better. I assume all the opportunities got better. Right. Uh, right. You got to work with many different directors and yes. different productions. Right. What do you think it was in the opportunity with Stanley that said to yourself, even though I thought I knew the trajectory of my career, mm. I've found a higher calling here? I think it's because, you know, one of the reasons, I guess, why I sort of gravitated in the first place to, to acting was because I'm one of those people who, who doesn't matter what's going on, I'm living in a moment. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, you know, if I was, I don't know, I used to rehearse a play, you know, plays for a uh, theatre in London called the Royal Court Theatre, which was a very kind of experimental, kind of improvisational based theatre with modern playwrights, modern playwrights. And it's, um, I, you know, for maybe five or six weeks, we'd rehearse just to do a performance on two Sundays. Mm -hmm. And you were paid like $7.50 for the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't even enough to cover rent. But it never bothered me. It never bothered me until I finished, you know, doing it and realizing that, oh, now I'm in this moment where I owe the rent. <laughs> <laughs> and how do I do this one? And so that becomes another, you know, kind of bubble mm -hmm. that you were. And so my, I feel that's the kind of person I am anyway. And so, um, you know, here today, I think this is such an, an amazing, amazing experience, uh, you know, to be here and all these people who are interested and want to know and either are a part of the process or want to be a part of the process. And it's, it's so kind of delightful. And I, I've got a feeling that a lot of you are the same, you know, because when you're creating, you are only in that moment. And I don't mean creating in a highfalutin way, you know, like a Stanley, because we'd sit around for hours without anything to say. And you say, well, it's interesting, but it's not interesting enough. Right. And so you had to find your way, you, know, you switch gears and you look at it in a different way. So, you know, I think it was just that. And when, I, you know, the possibility of that, of, of being able to do that. Because as an actor, you come in, you do your bit, and then you disappear. This way, you're with a project. All the way through. From beginning to the very, very end. And that's what really appealed to me. It sounds like, in a sense, you know, you found a calling in a bigger way, where yes, with acting, sure. you have to get permission, and I think that's always the tricky part of it. In right. the same way for music supervisors or composers, we're asking for permission to play ball on someone's team. Right. There's something very compelling about being able to be like, I'm going to be part of the genesis of this, and right. I'm going to be part of the fruition of it, and when it's all wrapped up, and you did a lot of work in post-production, including the marketing and right. you know, yeah. the DVD releases and all That's that. Right. Did yeah. you find yourself engaged with Stanley in a different way in each process, or was the relationship almost always um, the same? Well, the longer we worked together, I mean, the more he kind of left to my own devices. You know, you, you learn what it is that you need to do, and which applies to all the different kind of jobs, really, as a basic you know, thing that you go through, process that you go through, which is this needs to be done and you don't think about anything else at all. That's the goal. But what happens, of course, you've got thousands of other things coming at you at the same yeah. time. And so you kind of learn that, okay, that's, that's put aside because now this is more urgent. This has got, got to be done by tomorrow morning or by nine o'clock or whatever it was. And, you know, I, I really have... A, Del Toro, once, he, he once said, you know, the thing about artists, and I don't mean artists in the, you know, I mean artists as artisans, people who work inside. Artisans. Versus artisans, yeah. And um, we're all very disobedient. Mm -hmm. And so we do find ways, if you're free enough to be able to do it, you do find ways, you know, to solve problems and mm -hmm. to, Okay, you pull something else in, and right. you know, and you you cut a corner. Yes, yeah, absolutely. But you know why you're doing it, and you know, right. okay, from experience now, I didn't, I don't need that corner anymore. Right. Mm. You can be rebellious and at the same time disciplined. Yeah. Yes. And I, I want to talk a little bit also about um, music because, mm. in my mind, what Stanley Kubrick's films represent with music is 
I, I think the high water mark in, in all media. I, I, I don't think anyone was a more gifted um, narrator of story and context and subtext than what you guys did on Stanley Kubrick's films. Right. And I'm curious a little bit about how that process evolved. It sounds like there was some music that was used early on. You had mentioned in The Shining that there was a piece by, was it Sibelius? That was that you would play but didn't yes, end up in the yeah. film. Um, it was a piece called Waltz Trist. And it's a very melancholic kind of waltz, you know, and, uh, and it's very beautiful too. And so he, sometimes he'd play that on set while, just before we were preparing to rehearse with Danny and, and, and uh, Shelley Duvall and Jack, you know. And it was a kind of a calming kind of thing and a little bit weird when you think of the, the actual storyline plot of The Shining. And so he was, he was you know, seriously thinking that that would be the what theme. he used as, as the sort of key music and the, um, and the theme. But as he was going through editing, Stanley used to play music all the time. I mean, all the time. I mean, when he was actually working and editing and even when we were just sitting around looking at reels and checking things out. And he said, you know, the world is the biggest music library you'll ever find in your life. So you might as well go out there and just look for stuff, look for it, look for it. And so that's how, you know, he came across a lot of the music that he, you know, used in, for instance, in Clockwork Orange. Mm -hmm. You know, when he came across, who used to be Walter Carlos, is now Wendy Carlos. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, he, uh, he was a switched on Bach record. Switched on Bach, yeah, yeah. And he realized that it was something, I mean, in the early 70s, it was something that really sounded very futuristic. Yes. And, but at the same time, it was formed. It wasn't atonal. Right. And it was, it was using Bach, which is very yes, yes. mathematical and exactly. very structured. Exactly, exactly. And so, you know, very often, in Full Metal Jacket, I can't tell you what one of the best finds we ever had. We were listening to music all the time as he was cutting. And then there was a couple of albums we got from a New York radio station. You know, just they play all the goofy stuff and some of the you know, music that they actually played in programs. And we heard something absolutely crazy called Surfing Bird. Mm -hmm. And... <laughs> you guys remember that? And And we just, he said, this is crazy. He said, he said but let's, let's sort of just put it aside and see if it could fit in at any time. And we'd come to the final mix and we still hadn't found anything for after the first sort of action where they go into Way City, um, there's a scene where the helicopter lands and they're carrying in all the wounded and loading them up and the helicopter goes up and flies away. And he was thinking, well, what can we use for that? And he suddenly remembered we had this track. And so we got the track and we lined it up with the scene and we played it and we started it exactly where it should start, you know, the beginning of the scene. And it fitted perfectly. We didn't have to trim a frame or anything. It just, the length of it was perfect. Exactly. The length of the it scene, ends at the right moment. Weird. And so, I mean, he just sort of looked at me and he said, well, you see, Leon, you know when it works is when it, this kind of happens. So, you know, when it works, it works. And you realize that, yeah, okay, that's, it's serendipitous, but unless you give serendipity a, a shot, yes. you're never going to know. And so, you know, but other times it was a very long, slow process where he knew what it was he wanted in there, but it was getting the emotional temperature of the scene right. to kind of match. And if he couldn't, then, you know, you'd kill your darling. You'd just say, well, it's not going to work, that music. So we'd keep looking, keep looking, keep looking. We talked a little bit about, you know, uh, which I, I, one of the moments in, in, in the films that really struck me were in Eyes Wide Shut and the Shostakovich piece that opens up the party yeah. and sets us in. And it's one of those moments where a piece of music 
continues to churn inside of you. It's almost like having spicy Thai food that keeps on yeah, changing yeah. your relationship with it and yeah. you just keep on shifting. And later <coughs> in the film, and, and we had talked about this you know, the, in the scene when Nicole Kidman's character says to Tom Cruise that she would have left him and their family and everything they built together right. from one moment, one tryst with this, you know, this sailor. Right. And, and, and I remember as it, watching it and my heart sank Somehow it tied into that Shostakovich piece in a way. Yes. It kind of, th there's a thread that made sense. There was a truth to that piece that yes. ran through the entire film. Right. Do you think that there was an awareness of those processes or was it that things landed and you left them there and they kind of did their own thing? I think, you know, something like that would come, you know, in any number of ways. And, you know, very often it was just listening to something and it sort of strikes a chord inside him, you know, inside of him, and, and he, he kind of thought, okay, that's something that throws the whole thing mm -hmm. in a, a different direction. Yeah. Because it's, it's a wonderful piece of music. Yeah. And I remember when he first uh, found it, he called me into his office and he, and he started playing it and he said, guess who this is by, who, who composer. And it's really hard because yeah. It's you would like never nothing guess. Nothing else he ever, he ever did, Shostakovich. I don't know of another piece of his entire catalogue that's even close to it. No, right. No, absolutely not. And it, it was that kind of wonderful, whimsical thing from Shostakovich's side, it yeah. seemed. But also, it kind of suited Stanley for the kind of deep theme of Eyes Wide Shut, which is. Life is whimsical, mm -hmm. you know, very and, much and, you so. know, waltzes are, and again, a waltz was used in 2001 in Space Odyssey as well, but they're, they're mating dances. They're formal ways of presenting something that is supposed to be hidden. Right. And in many ways, it runs from the theme of the whole film in a really kind of exciting way. Right, 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 no, absolutely. And uh, I think that's the wonderful thing about, you know, film music is the way that it's opened out and developed now in the last, what, 30, 40 years. And it's, you kind of think, well, oh, it's, never, it's never going to end because there's a lot of inventiveness that's coming all the time. Yeah. You know, I've heard some wonderful, you know, soundtracks. You know, I'm, I'm not generally, you know, I wasn't... Let me, let me explain something about 2001, that he actually had a composer do a, a soundtrack for the film, and he listened to it. And as good as it was, and it was, it was a, a beautiful piece of work, rather like you know, John Williams. You yeah. know? And it really, you sort of, it's there, it's, it's beautiful, it's beautiful, but it sounded like a soundtrack. It made it kind of earthbound. It kind of tied you up to a familiarity that you didn't really want to have. Right. And that's when he started looking for the... He, he heard Ligeti somewhere. I don't know where he was telling me this because I wasn't with him then. Um, he found a piece of Ligeti and it just absolutely went ping mm -hmm. in his head. And he just listened to everything that he could of Ligeti's and he realised that, OK, this is something that's kind of ethereal in itself. I mean, Ligeti, it's like it, nothing know? sounds like it. No, exactly, exactly. And it was just such a, a, a beautiful, I don't know, another serendipitous thing that struck his, his mind as, as being workable, and then it kind of took off. Mm -hmm. And he was actually right up to when he was, they were going to actually screen the film publicly, I think with a, a week before it was going to be screened, he was still, he was telexing music publishers and asking them for the rights. By the way, and, this is playing tomorrow, and... <laughs> yeah. And he was getting these messages back saying, Mr. Kubrick, this is not the way we usually do things. And um, <laughs> which never bothered Stanley at all. <laughs> this is like Stanley Kubrick, uh, clearance specialist. Yeah, yeah, I mean, absolutely. It was just an amazing process. And that was the, the other thing. It was such a magic... It felt like a magic process sometimes, and leaving yourself open all the time, mm -hmm. you know, to these sort of little accidents. I mean, where does an idea come from? You know, you can't, I don't think anyone can say, that was my idea. It's come from something, and it can be very, very subconscious. It can be somebody who said something, mm -hmm. you know, which happened in The Shining. It was a carpenter who actually said, 
I like the sound of Danny going over the carpets and the wood because we were going to pull up the carpets because getting the steady cam around, you were hitting them right. all the time. Keep on hitting it. And so when Stanley actually heard a playback of a rehearsal, he said, yeah, it does sound. So we just had to work out a way to make it work. And you know, that, it, that's become a kind of, um, I don't know what you, iconic. Mm-hmm. You know, they used to show it all the time. There's little Danny cycling around near here. And it became really sort of so hard. It was almost like music. And then when it stops and we land on yes. the twins, yes. it's so powerful. Absolutely. You know, and it came from a guy on the set who wasn't an actor or anything. Right. And he just said, say that again. And he said it. And so he listened and he did it. Mm-hmm. So, you know, he was as open as anybody to anybody's ideas. And he had to have the bravery <laughs> to actually suggest something mm-hmm. because he could say, ah, oh shit, it's the worst thing I ever heard in my life. And <laughs> so I guess a lot of people were put off by that. but. You had to take your courage in your hands sometimes mm-hmm. and just say, how about if, Right. you know? And, and the best leaders in many ways are those who are not threatened by the ideas as they come. Right. They, they let the room be a place where ideas can percolate. Absolutely. And they draw from the right ones. Exactly. exactly. I'm curious for when, when, you know, as you guys were working together, one of the things that I always assumed that everything was so meticulously planned ahead of time, uh-huh. but it sounds like in many ways, the artistry was in the process of creating the moments by bringing these different ingredients together mm. and having the time to let them unfold. Had you ever worked with anyone with that type of format before? Or did this feel th- truly original to you? Uh, no, I mean, I'd never worked with anyone who was that open and meticulous, but you say meticulous, but at the same time, he, he could be quite a freewheeler, mm-hmm. you know, for a control freak, you know. It, I kind of say you'd be surprised at how much he kind of took from a, from an actor or a cameraman, mm-hmm. you know, from a, you know an operator or the DOP, and it's one of those things that you know he was open, he was open, he was open all the time, uh, and it was only you know the very technical sort of scenes, like if they had visual effects and special effects, most of which we did in camera, you know, 2001 was all done in camera. There's not a, well, computers weren't capable of doing it in those days. It didn't, it, there was no technology no at the time. CGI or anything. It's just I mean, it's amazing. amazing. No one even knew what these things looked like. No, I know, I know. It's amazing. It was really amazing. So, you know, all those things sort of come together at, at some point. And yeah, sure, there's a lot of kind of wastage. You have to, I think Bergman said, you know, you have to kill your darlings because you can fall in love with something so much that it's stopping you from, it's blocking you from actually taking it in the direction which seems right, mm-hmm. you know? So there's a lot of sacrifice of ideas, even if they're good ones, but he was open to that too, you know? Did you find, because I would imagine it must have been, you worked with him for such a long time that in a sense there must have been moments when you thought to yourself, have I made the right choice? Or did you find that that was not the case? Yeah, yeah, especially when he was mad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Stanley was one of those people who, I mean, I might have to say, he was a bit like my father, actually. You know, when he, when things were going well and, you know, you, he felt like there was harmony and everything, I mean, he, it, he was like a pussycat. Mm-hmm. And if something was wrong, if I'd made a, a mistake or I hadn't sort of... Um, finished the task when I was supposed to, we called everything tasks, um, then if he was in the wrong frame of mind, I mean, you got a tongue lashing that you wouldn't believe. But at the same time, it was forgotten like that. As soon as you went back into it and it's back in worked again. it out, it's back, yes. He had to express yes. with, the, with the importance that was what was at stake. Absolutely, and he was in the best, in the nicest sense of the word, he was very childish, you know, he couldn't help but, you know, emote <laughs> kind of constantly, even when he was in some kind of repose, there was something there that you kind of felt was coming from him. And if he was enthusiastic about something, you know, he'd almost kill you, you know, just sort of 
talking about it and you, yeah, 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 I know, it's great, it's great, it's all right, I get it, I get it, <laughs> you know? But the same if, you know, if when I was ill for a while, he was so kind of concerned and so, I don't know, rather beautiful actually, but it, it became too much. It was like, Stanley, I'm going to get better if you just stop smothering me right. with, <laughs> with kindness. <you> know? <laughs> it is absolutely true. So uh, that's the other thing, you know, when I look back on it, the way that you always kept on your toes, you know, mentally, you had to be mentally alert. And um, I guess that's something else which I'll carry with me, you know, forever, because it's, you really have to be aware of what's going on around you. But that can be a trap too. Yeah. Because you can suddenly go off on, you know, I find myself sometimes, you know, when I'm working and I come across a word and I find it, hmm, that's interesting. That word is a word we use all the time, maybe. Uh, and I realize that it sounds kind of strange mm -hmm. if you really just repeat it over and over. And so I get into a, you know, the dictionary and I think, oh, right, it comes from Latin or it comes from whatever it is. And then suddenly I'm off. I'm just looking at word. Oh, there's another word and there's another word and another word. And so, you know, I, you, you have to pull on back on some of those instincts that you right. have. You know, interesting as it is, you know, you save it for another time because you, you should be here now. Right. It, it sounds like in many ways one of the great gifts that Stanley gave to you was the idea that you need to be present 100% yes. yeah. and to commit 100% to what you're doing. Mm. And his own maybe mercurial at time ways was always based upon the project. It wasn't based on ego from what I can tell. No, no, no. I mean, he had ego. I think everybody does. And if anybody says they don't, I don't believe them. <laughs> it's just the extent. I, mean, I, I always say that Stanley was like, and this is true, Stanley was like everybody you could possibly meet. You know, he had the same likes, dislikes, you know, same reactions to certain situations. And I say the difference, Stanley, to normal people, for want of a better word, is that it was to the power of a gazillion. You know, when he was mad, he was apoplectic. Mm -hmm. And when he was, you know, when he liked something, you know, he was a goofy with his pet, with his dogs and, you know. With many animals. Yeah, I mean, really. And, um, and everything in between, you know. And depending on time of day and what was going on, you really saw a full person. I always say, you know, I, I always fall back to sort of quoting Hamlet, excuse me, um, when Horatio, his best friend, Hamlet's best friend, says he was the most observed of all, of all observers. And that's very much Stanley, mm -hmm. you know, he observed. And I think that's why sometimes people have kind of thought his films were cold. I don't find them cold at all. Quite the opposite. No, absolutely. <laughs> you know, he just shows you there is, we have to coexist between the positives and the negatives. It's rather spiritual, but you know, it's not a question of making sure there's a happy ending. Life doesn't end like that for a lot of people, you know? And you have to be as honest about that as you do about, it's nice to have, you know, they live happily ever after sometimes, but it can't be the only way that you see life a story or you know, some kind of occurrence. One thing which, you know, this audience here, some of the folks who are in this group are, are seekers. They're trying to figure out what their place is. And one of the things that we're hoping to do with this conference is give different ideas that inspire people and say, there's a place for you. Here's where you're welcome. Here's a place where you, who you are naturally right. is going to have a home and there's other people like you. Right. Um, Tell me a little bit if you have any thoughts of things that you could recommend to some of the people in the audience of how they approach things that maybe you have drawn from in your experiences. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, the fact that there are people here who have specifically wanted to come here and to pursue whether it's music or whatever it is, you know, you obviously have a love for it. That's a given. 
You know, there are some people, of course, in the world who don't actually have that kind of feeling. They see it more as a, an exercise in, 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 you know, I don't know, gaining some kind of status or whatever it is. But the majority of people I've worked with in, in my life have all had this basic love for what it is they're doing. Now, that's good, but it's not enough. Because I find that very often what you do need is something called perseverance. Because you're going to go through really hard times, bad times, not just because of the situations that you find inside the so-called industry. And I hate using that word. I think it's terribly demeaning <laughs> to a lot of what we do, you know. Um, but the fact of the matter is that you've got to be able to say, OK, all right, this this isn't working and you've got to be brave enough to say, okay, I've taken the wrong route. And even if, you know, it means that you worked for a year or two years on something, you've got to find that courage to say, okay, I don't need to throw it away completely. There are bits of this that can be used in other projects or whatever it is. And you should have your storeroom of those things that you keep. Um, you know, and be aware that they're there, so you can utilize them some other time. But for the most part, you know, it's, it's really a struggle with oneself, I think, you know, that um, you'll have doubts, of course, and you'll have some will be unlucky enough to have depressions. <laughs> I put my hand up there, because you go through all those stages, you really will. But if you have perseverance, then it's, it's more, you can, you can deal with it in a better way. You know, I feel so bad sometimes because I know a lot of people, actors and, you know, people in the, you know, sort of, you know, cameramen, musicians and what have you, and, you know, who would, I would say actors who, who I think were 10 times better than I ever was that never got anywhere. And it may have had something to do with personality or expectations or whatever it is. But, you know, you're not the only one. And I think you should also remember that, you know, keep yourself kind of sacred and keep your ideals kind of sacred, but understand that, you know, there are nuances which shape us sometimes without us even knowing, and you have to be open to that too. And I can't think of anything else to say but that. Yeah, find the right light and follow it passionately. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, ladies and, and gentlemen... be disobedient. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Round of applause. Thank you.